Bisme. Okay, all right. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept our humble obeisances. Our glory is to Jagat Guru Shri Prabhupada. Our glory is to Guru Dev. Our glory is to Samuel Vaishnava Vaishnavi devotees. Uh, we thank you all for being here again today. Today is Tuesday. Um, and we are blessed. We have His Grace, Sarvat Mahaprabhu, uh, whom I will be introducing a uh, little bit more uh, probably after the lecture, by which time we might have had more devotees here. Uh, but Sarvat Mahaprabhu is my big brother here in Gita Nagri, and he's been so kind to me. So personally, I'm so much thankful that he is able to be here with us today. Um, like I said, I will share a bit more about him after the class. But Prabhuji, you're very much uh, welcome to Hare Krishna Africa platform. I believe today is your first day speaking. You've been here before hearing. Uh, but I believe this is your first time speaking. So without further ado, we may put the verse on the screen and then you take it over from here. And after you are done uh, sharing your insight about the text, then devotees may also ask uh, questions or share realizations or comments. And it's very interesting, if I'm not mistaken, this text seems to be the last of the uh, Chakru Sloki of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's very interesting you have to speak on that. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, Prabhu. One question I have is that the purpose is very, very long. Yes. Uh, do you want me to read it all regardless? Uh, no, you, you handle it the way you want to. Okay. How long do we have? Um... Usually we speak for about an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, after that, devotee may ask questions. But if you if you have to go more than an hour, that is also okay. No, it's okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, uh, these these uh, texts in uh, chapter nine of Canto two are quite lengthy. They are they are like a, a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> Shri Prabhupada poured out lots of love in them. So you you handle it the way you, you see fit. Yes. Okay. You, said you, were gonna, you say you were going to share? Uh, share yes. Hmm? yes, I'm going to do that now. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Hare Krishna devotees. Hare Krishna. Etava deva jigyasam, tatva jigyasunatmana, and vaya vyati de kabyam, yatsyat sarvatra sarvada. So we'll go directly to, to the text. A person who is searching after the supreme absolute truth, the personality of God, it must certainly search for it up to this in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. And here is the purport by Srila Prabhupada. To unfold the mystery of Bhakti Yoga, as it is explained in the previous verse, is the ultimate stage of all inquiries or the highest objective for the inquisitive. Everyone is searching after self-realization in different ways, by karma yoga, by jnana yoga, by dhyana yoga, by raja yoga, by bhakti yoga, etc. To engage in self-realization is the responsibility of every living entity developed in consciousness. One who is developed in consciousness certainly makes inquiries into the mysteries mystery of the self, of the cosmic situation, and of the problems of life in all spheres and fields, social, political, economical, economic, cultural, religious, moral, etc., and in their different branches. But here, the goal of such inquiries is explained. Let me, let me just stop here. I want to 
offer my prayers first, just in case, uh, since the purpose is so long, maybe we'll stop and uh, elucidate some things mm -hmm. or make it even more obscure as uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to ascertain. The Bhagavatam is such a, such a deep manuscript. Um, Om Gyanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Nangayati Girim Yad Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Gurundina Taranam Paramananda Maharam Shri Chaitanya Mishwaram So let's, uh, let me, I'm going to put the verse on my page as well as so I can follow it um, at will. So this, uh, this, as you were saying, there is four verses of the Chatur Shloki or the nutshell verses or the condensation, the four essential verses of the Bhagavatam, one can say that Lord Krishna spoke directly to Lord Brahma. Basically, if he had to summarize the entire Bhagavatam in four verses, he did it using these verses. And starting with the about Ahame Vasame Bagre, that would be the first verse of the Chatur Shloki. And it will be actually convenient for our discussion to to go to these verses, to to just at least the verses themselves. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so we'll start with that verse. Brahma, and this is Lord Krishna speaking, it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation, when there was nothing but myself, nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead, and after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. So that's the first verse of the Chatur Shloki. Now, we'll read the second one, which goes, O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Now, the third verse of the Chatur Shloki, which is, O Brahma, Please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter into the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I am outside of everything. And we arrive to the last verse of the Chatur Shloki, which is the one for today. A person who is searching up to the absolute Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of God, it, must certainly search for it up to this in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. And I would like to read also the um, translation by Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur, which is similar, but not exactly the same as Srila Prabhupada's. He says, and this is a translation for the verse 36, the person desiring to know the best sadhana and the goal of that sadhana must learn by surrender to Guru about this truth, which is determined as the best by obtaining positive results through performance and by lack of results through non-performance and by performance at all times and all places. The person desiring the highest truth must experience rasa, which produces bliss through meeting and separation and continuance continues in all places eternally. Now let's let's put a little light here. The beginning of a purport uh, says that 
their self-realization, everyone is searching after self-realization in different ways. In other words, according to what Prabhupada says, whatever people do is because they think that's the goal of their life. So, and whether they be they believe that the self is the soul or the self is the body of the self is the mind or the intelligence or the ego or a combination of all of them everybody's engaged in a so-called process of self-realization and it's through karma yoga jnana yoga dhyana yoga and raja yoga bhakti yoga but there is a difference as uh, vishwanatha chakravarti takur puts it that bhakti yoga is the only one of the processes that is the same as always eternally whereas the other ones karma yoga is is to become um, liberated free from to 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 be happy or to gana yoga to to merge with the impersonal uh, feature of the lord dhyana yoga by meditation uh, raja yoga to to be free from misery but all these things and and there is a goal to them and that's the goal once you attain the goal that's it you're done whereas bhakti yoga the goal continues to expand because the goal is to love krishna and krishna is infinitely lovable the, the word krishna means irresistible so that means it's not like you fall in love and then you think oh may, there may be someone else or down the road you find something else Krishna continues to improve and increase his love for you as well. So we are to accompany, accompany Krishna in this eternal journey. And uh, Prabhupada refers here, someone developing consciousness makes inquiries into the mystery of the self. So out of eight plus billion people in this world, uh, we don't and and anybody who is connected to social media, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or whatever, or Facebook, can see. Because nowadays it's a lot easier to see to um to see people's minds because people just they have hardly any secrets and they reveal their pos current position and their inquiries and their concerns and so on, that very, very few, very, very few out of the eight plus billion people in this world are actually concerned about uh, understanding God. Of course, there are many religions, there are many paths, and these religions, they... They have a dogma usually attached to it that people think that is the goal. The goal is to belong. Like we want to belong in our community. So people think, oh, God has a club and I want to be part of that club. And other people are not qualified. The vision of the Vaishnavas is that everybody is a devotee even animals, even plants, any living entity, any animated being is part and parcel of the Supreme. And therefore, a uh, practitioner of Bhakti Yoga who was, is a, at a different degree of forgetfulness. So we try to encourage everyone to practice Bhakti Yoga. However, there are many other paths that um, people practice for trying to understand their self and trying to understand God, but uh, without a guru. And this is this is one of the emphasis. This is from a translation by Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur, that without a guru is um, the guide. Without guidance, uh, it's like without GPS. Of course, there was. There's a pre-GPS era where we had maps and asked for directions and so on. But essentially, um, this, is, this is the GPS to spiritual life, is the guru. And the guru is not just giving instruction, but he's actually a practitioner himself or herself. So it is our 
uh, regardless of our interest, the first step, and this is emphasized throughout all the all the verses, that one has to accept the authority of a bona fide spiritual master, with without which is is basically a fruitless endeavor. There's a there's a limit to one's there's a perimeter to one's understanding. Even people like Plato, who was so smart in ancient uh, Greece. Of course, he had um, a mentor like Socrates, and he presents um, some of the some of the basic dialogues and the methods that and the conclusions that Socrates gave, and in a very smart way, as um, presenting it as a dialogue. And you cannot, uh, Prabhupada refers to. Uh, a saying from India that is, you cannot tell a fool until they open their mouth. So this is the this is the method preferred by Plato to present Socrates having dialogues with different people and showing, you know, the stupidity of uh, human beings. But even Plato, with his brilliant um, expanded consciousness, could not get very far because he didn't have a link to the disciplic succession coming directly from Krishna. And he, uh, Krishna is instructing Lord Brahma um, directly. Uh, of course, this is a, a rare privilege. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, Lord Brahma was befuddled, uh, flummoxed, bewildered, sitting on a lotus flower in the middle of nowhere. And... He didn't know what to do. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know who he was. Um, and he heard the word tapas, which means um, austerity, which is the first instruction directly from the Lord. Of course, the I Italians may uh, may debate that, that if because if you say tapas, 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 it ends up being pasta. So they they may think that that's what Lord Brahma heard, that the first instruction was to figure out how to make pasta. This is, this is I, I will say, is erroneous. But in any case, Lord Brahma, after practicing tapasya, he achieved uh, the goal, which was to understand the process of creation. He composed this beautiful poetry, in honor of Govinda, known as uh, the Brahma Samhita, although the Brahma Samhita is just uh, only one chapter, a fifth chapter, that Lord Chaitanya found in South India. So this is the this is the beginning. It begins by practicing austerities, accepting a guru, and then one may um, develop a little bit of a higher consciousness, which is very difficult. Very, very difficult uh, because, uh, as I was saying, out of eight, 8 billion people, how many practitioners of bhakti yoga, how many have discovered that bhakti yoga is the most direct, shortest, most effective, deepest path to self realization? And out of those practicing bhakti yoga, how many actually succeed, at least in one lifetime? Um, and this was the question that Arjuna had. For Krishna in the in the Gita, what happens? Um, because he anticipated that not everybody is on the highest level. So what happens when someone is not doesn't complete the process? Because it seems to be difficult. It's difficult not because the process itself is difficult, but because we have a lot of baggage and it's very hard to put it down and continue to move on. We continue to acquire uh, unnecessary things and unnecessary habits and bad habits that we carry from previous lives. So um, Krishna says, Srimatam Suchinam Gehe. That this is not stopped. This, this death doesn't stop the process of bhakti. They will, a person will be born in a family of um, Brahmins 
or some those who are acquainted with serving the devotees and serving the Lord and uh, practicing austerities and offering their food, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and reading scripture, or in a in a wealthy family. One may say, "Well, well, but that, what's the advantage of that? I mean, you can be just a bunch of materialists." But for those who don't have money, opulence seems to be uh, a, a very desirable goal. Like most of the world is looking for opulence, to be rich, to be beautiful, to be famous. But all these things happen by karma. One will be born with all these things just from previous sukriti, from pious activities. So to be born in a family that where one doesn't need anything, is not struggling for the basic necessities of life, makes one, first of all, free from all this encumberment. Like, you know, this is not the goal. And they make them even more desirous. How come I have what everybody else wants and I'm not happy? And I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I'm born ignorant. So that's the that's the idea that bhakti uh, has a kind of like a like a start um, that whatever you ended in the last life, you start from that point in the next life. It's like uh, it's like going to see Balaji in Tirupati. And and if you are, if you have some, how how can I call it, uh, influence, some leverage, then you don't have to wait at the end of the line, which is miles long. You can just cut in the middle of it. They just they just take you there by the hand through some tunnels and different rooms, and you, know, you cut right in the center of it. And but. The darshan is the same. It's about two seconds long. When you get, I, I don't. After waiting for hours and walking for miles, I, I can't remember seeing the Didi. Actually, I was in front of the Didi for such a short period of time that I can't remember anything, except that there was a constant flow, a human flow, like a river, like a river that has swollen. So anyway, let's. Let's continue with the with the purport. The Vedanta Sutra philosophy begins with this inquiry about life. As as you will all probably know, Tato Brahma Jigyasa. Uh, you know what's what's the goal of life is to understand uh, Brahma or the self and the supreme self. And the Bhagavatam answers such inquiries up to this point for the mystery of all inquiries. Lord Brahma wanted to be perfectly educated by the personality of Godhead. And here is the answer by the Lord, finishing four nutshell verses, from Mahameva to the verse Etavadeva. This is the end of all self-realization processes. Men do not know that the ultimate goal of life is Vishnu, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, due to being bewildered by the glaring reflection in the darkness. And as such, everyone is entering into the darkest region of material existence, driven by the uncontrolled senses. So this is the uh, this is a trick of Maya that one will pursue a certain uh, desirable goal, but that's Maya shining behind it, and one when one achieves that goal whether it be wealth or money or sex or rock and roll whatever whatever your goal is then maya will just move and shine behind something else and then you will end up with water sand between your fingers and it just goes through and there's nothing left so the only satisfying process is bhakti because it's is love what we are searching for. It's, we want to be loved and we want to love. And because we have this capacity to unlimited love, we do have access to that, unlimited love. In other words, we have the capacity to receive unlimited love and the capacity to give unlimited love. And only Krishna, who is unlimited, can reciprocate with that. Everybody else falls short. And if we love Krishna, we will love everything 
about him, and that includes the spiritual and even material creation. So we wouldn't want to exploit it or control it or micromanage it. We will want to um, give credit where credit is due. And we will be interested in Krishna. It's, it's like having, uh, being a, a young boy and uh, having a, a toy that is one's favorite toy. And if anybody comes near or tries to take it or tries to play with it, then jealousy and egotism and you know, just anger come, immediately comes about. However, if we are grown up and we still have that toy and somebody wants to take it, we, we're somewhat puzzled. You know, why does this person want this toy from my childhood? But we are not attaching him. We are playing with other toys. So we always find time to find new toys to play with. And once the toy is taken away, we can't play with it. But Krishna is unlimited. We uh, and we may we may feel okay, but if I love Krishna, you know, there are so many other people that are better at it. You know, Krishna won't pay attention to me. No, Krishna has a direct personal relationship with everyone, and is the only one who can fulfill that void that we feel about having a relationship at all. So we should concentrate on, and Krishna is not alone. As uh, we, we could see that Prabhupada didn't like pictures of Krishna by himself. It has to be the gopis, the gopas, a cow, the mother Jasoda, Nanda Maharaj, they are killing demons, this, no, Krishna is never alone. Krishna is always surrounded by his devotees. So if we think that, oh, I will love Krishna, but I, you know, I don't like this other person, that doesn't work that way. Krishna means Krishna and his devotees. And the problem that we have is our uncontrolled senses, that they keep dragging us back to the material world. It's like having a recurrent bad dream that you can't get rid of. It. But... Um, What's the solution? Stay awake. So this is what Krishna consciousness is. You know, don't go to the nightmare. Just don't don't partake on it. You can't fix it. The material world is has a built-in obsolescence and fallibility that it can't be fixed, and we are constantly trying to fix everything. But nothing can fix the material world. It's built in such a way as it's like buying a bad car. You can keep putting money into it, but the car is just a lemon. You know, don't waste your money on lemons. So this is this is what the material world is. It is a lemon, and it's meant to be a lemon. It's advertised as a lemon. We still go for it. But Maya, who has a very thankless task, continues to advertise. You know, it puts... Like people, you know, when they're selling a, a ride, ride on lawnmower, you know, they put a woman in a bikini because they think you will never see a woman in a, a nice looking woman in a bikini mowing the lawn. But still, there's a good point to sell it because lust is what sells, not not the lawnmower. The lawnmower is just a noisy machine with a with a with a big uh, thing at the bottom that cuts the grass. So it's, there's no appeal. There is no sex appeal to a lawnmower. But something can sell. So Maya is the advertising genius for the material world that sells us all kinds of limits constantly. And we buy them. And we continue to pay. And even though the interest is huge, matter of fact, the interest to get from Maya never stops. So if we borrow from Maya, we will be paying interest life after life. Never touch the principal. Never. You will only pay interest. So Maya is uh, the biggest loan shark. You can, as soon as you borrow something, you, you will never get rid of that debt. Whereas Krishna... Krishna will give you 
more than you deserve, more than you want. He's just waiting for us to, for the most insignificant demonstration of real, true devotion. Devotion means love. It's not like you bow down or you, you are on your knees or you offer selected prayers. Uh, Prabhupada said, is your emotion, is, is how you approach the Lord with sincerity, not with duplicity, that will convince Krishna. Because what does Krishna need from us? What, what is that Krishna doesn't have? Krishna has everything. But there is one thing that he doesn't have, and that's our love, because that's a voluntary item. So if you give what Krishna doesn't want, that's what he wants. That doesn't have, that's what he wants. And if you give something else, you no, know, you get something else in return. Usually through the agency of Mahamaya. And if you give Krishna what he wants, then your reward is that you will deal with Yoga Maya. Uh, so this is this is a very convenient engagement. So here Prabhupada continues, the whole material existence has sprung up because of sense gratification, desires based principally on the sex desire. And the result is that in spite of all advancement in knowledge, the final goal of all activities of the living entities is sense gratification. But here is a real goal of life, and everyone should know it by inquiries put before a bona fide spiritual master expert in the science of Bhakti Yoga or from a living personality of Bhagavatam life. Everyone is engaged in various kinds of spiritual in inquiries, but the Srimad Bhagavatam gives answers to all of the various students of self-realization. This ultimate objective of life is not to be searched out without great labor or perseverance. One who is imbued with such sincere inquiries must ask the bona fide spiritual master in the displicit succession from Brahmaji, and that is the direction given here. Because the mystery was disclosed before Brahmaji by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the mystery of all such inquiries regarding self-realization must be put before a spiritual master who is directly the representative of the Lord acknowledged in that disciplic succession. Such a bona fide spiritual master is able to clear up the whole thing by evidence from the revealed scriptures, both direct and indirect. Although everyone is free to consult the revealed scriptures in this connection, one still requires the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. And that is, that is the direction of in this verse. The bona fide spiritual master is the most confidential representative of the Lord, and one must receive direction from the spiritual master in the same spirit that Brahmaji received it from the personality of God, Lord Krishna. So this is uh, this is actually a secret yeah, of Bhakti Yoga and of of self-realization, that one has to find a bona fide spiritual master. And also, um, as here said, that um, it's not necessarily that our Diksha Guru is the only bona fide spiritual master. Our tradition is Shiksha, actually, is receiving instruction from wherever it comes. And we can find personalities, Bhagavad, in so many places, by the grace of Srila Prabhupada, this has expanded uh, what seemed like an impossible task uh, to put seeds on a barren land, which is, you know, Prabhupada came to the West. Is in, in India, it was somewhat easier. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's somewhat easier because <clears throat> people already know about Krishna and they know about austerities. They know about... Uh, Devotion. They know about a, a lot of things, offering to God. And in the West, we are used to sense gratification being our God. So it's, it was a very difficult task. Yet Prabhupada created uh, Bhagavat devotees in the West. So we can take shelter of it. Even, it doesn't even have to be a devotee. We can hear instruction from anyone, even a wino can give good directions uh, on spiritual life if, if inspired by the Lord from within and if one can hear properly. So this is our, that's why hearing is so important because we hear, we, of course, 
If we have a guru, then you can hear it from a right source. And if you don't, there are so many gurus that they're actually trying to guide you. And one has to have a fine tuning ear in order to hear the guru, which is Paramatma basically manifested in so many different ways. Um, the bona fide spiritual master in that bona fide chain of disciple succession never claims to be the Lord himself, although such a spiritual master is greater than the Lord in the sense that he can deliver the Lord by his personally realized experience. The Lord is not to be found simply by education or by a good fertile brain, but surely he can be found by the sincere student through the transparent medium of a bona fide spiritual master. So it's not, um, it's not just uh, a one-time thing, uh, disposable guru syndrome. This is this is an eternal situation where one actually is indebted to someone perennially for true and Krishna. So that's why they say the spiritual master is even more uh, kinder than Krishna because he can deliver Krishna. And Krishna is not so keen on revealing himself. Uh, why would he do that? Why would any of us reveal most intimate aspects of ourselves to some stranger that walks from a street and just wants to know? No, we need to see some, some kind of uh, proof of loyalty and of sincerity and etc cetera, etc cetera. and and that we like the person but krishna um so krishna may be reluctant to reveal himself but the devotee is so in love with krishna he wants to share it with everybody so there is that's why lord chaitanya is called mahavadanyaya the most munificent because he gave love of god to everyone She's, he broke open the storehouse of the love of God and just give it to anybody, regardless of their condition, regardless of their position, regardless of their interest. And the devotees have adopted the mood of Lord Chaitanya, giving Krishna consciousness to everyone, regardless. Regardless if they want it or not, they need, everybody needs it. There's no question about it. But it's very difficult. It doesn't stick. To some people, Krishna consciousness is like silicon and Teflon, you know, doesn't stick at all. Uh, I've seen cases where uh, people will come to, who have done programs throughout for many decades at home and in other places, and people show up and somehow or other they have this Sukriti, they have this karma that they are attracted to Krishna consciousness, but they must have committed some serious offenses or there is something impeding them from taking up Krishna consciousness. So they, uh, they are, they are philosophically waterproof. They don't get the philosophy. It's just somehow or other it doesn't penetrate their impenetrable brain. It's, they don't, they don't get, but they stick around. So Krishna doesn't, uh, doesn't the devotees Krishna would reject them? Why? Why keep someone around like that? But the devotees, in the mood of Lord Chaitanya, they just give an opportunity to everyone. Of course, there are some people. There is a phenomenon, a sociological phenomena, that these uh, freeloaders, loafers, that they actually drain the energy of those who are serious by just, you know making it look cheap, making it look easy and, and having nothing. It's just like parrots. Like a parrot can't repeat anything but doesn't understand the meaning of it. So we have to concentrate on those very rare souls, very sincere, that want to improve. Uh, there's a there's a problem in the, in the latest generations uh, that have uh, come up in America and in the world, people are um, they feel entitled and they they don't they don't give any they don't retain any knowledge they don't they don't feel the need because there is Google you don't have to remember anything you just Google it 
you, you can Google it a million times, you know, the same question. So they don't, they're ignorant and they're entitled. And it's, it's very difficult to try to teach Krishna consciousness to someone who thinks they know everything or uh, by, and it's not their fault in, in this case, that the parents told them that they were perfect. So if you're perfect, why would you feel the, why would you, feel the need to change anything? Why would you feel the necessity to improve if you're already perfect? So as um, we spent many years in uh, Santa Barbara, California, which is um, material close to paradise. Oh, well, there's also fires and floods and things like that. But, you know, baby people live there. They're, they're good looking, they're rich. They live in a gorgeous place like the American Riviera. The weather is the average temperature for the year is 72 degrees. You can actually look at a 10 day expanded, uh, extended forecast and it looks sunny and over 70 any time of the year. So, you know, this is a very beautiful place. But the thing is, it's very difficult to preach Krishna consciousness in a place where. Uh, people think that they are enjoying, that they are happy. So you tell them, uh, uh, you try to tell them, the, the material world is a place, place of misery, and they just look at you. Uh, what? What are you talking about? I mean, you can go to South America or Africa or uh, Asia or m many other places, or other places in America, and you say the material world is a place of misery, and they they totally get it. They understand, yes, of course it is. But there in Central California, no. <laughs> so if the material place is not a miserable place, why would you want to get out of it? Why would you why why have any impetus to practice self-realization if you're doing just fine? So anyway, um, I don't want to. I don't want to drag this unnecessarily uh, for too long. So we are at eleven forty-five. I, I want to read one one little thing about the um, the conclusion, but because uh, Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur gives commentaries to to the verses, and it's interesting that the last paragraph of a previous verse, two nine thirty-five, he says. Um, and this is as as the Lord speaking, as Krishna speaking. But I desire to show myself, because here is uh, um, why what's what's the impetus? He doesn't show himself to the non devotees. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't need, he doesn't have to. But he said, I desire to show myself to my obedient devotees. Who have entered my heart because it's you see that's the thing that we have we have the process of devotional service which krishna is very reluctant to give because it conquers his heart so it's it's like giving the key to your heart to someone uh you have you you should know for beyond any shadow of a doubt that that person is not going to betray you and that person is qualified and that person is deserving of what you're going to give him and there that way you can open up so krishna says krishna is is a supreme so is this tendency from us comes from him but i desire to show myself to my obedient devotees who have entered my heart who have perfected themselves and bow to me Remaining separate, not entering their hearts. I desire to offer my beauty to their eyes. I desire that my fragrance enters their nostrils and desire to fill their ears with the nectar of my sweet voice, speaking with them and answering them. I desire to make their limbs experience the sweet softness of my body by touching and embracing them. Thus situated inside my devotees and externally as well, I perform pastimes with great attachment for my pure devotees, beyond the gunas, whom I cannot give up. So this is this is Krishna's heart. Krishna's heart is the devotees. And as the devotees cannot give up Krishna, 
Krishna cannot give up the company, the association, and the love of his devotees. All right. So should we ask for some comments and questions, perhaps? Well, Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Prabhuji, for such a wonderful and beautiful uh, Shri Krishna Katha. Uh, yeah, uh, the purport is very deep and long. Uh, I, I remember His Holiness Guru Govinda uh, Maharaj used to say that you can discuss just one sentence of Shri Prabhupada's purports uh, for months. So you, you did a very good job uh, handling the paper today. Uh, Mother Shri Shapanishad, please you may unmute. Hare Krishna. Please Hare accept Krishna. my pranams, all glories to Srila yeah. Prabhupada, all glories to Bhakti Tirtha Swami, and all you wonderful Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Hari Bo Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for sharing that last prayer. It just touched my heart. It brought tears to my eyes. I can't even speak, but I wanted to share that with you. So thank you for sharing that beautiful prayer, prayer about Krishna's heart. I just, you know, I'm ecstatic. Thank you so much. We are uh, so, so very unworthy, aren't we? <laughs> well, I can only speak for myself. That just touched me. Thank you for, uh, I, I just got on. And when I got on, I just said, wow, I missed I said, I wanted to hear the lecture. And I've been doing so many things with so many wonderful lectures online or on the uh, on WhatsApp, on what's an internet. So I'm just like bouncing around. And I said, wow, I got to get here. And I got this at the last moment. So thank you so very much. So all Krishna is the best of planners, isn't he? Haribo, Hare Krishna. I just wanted to share that. Haribo. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you. I'm going to actually... Put it on the chat so you can uh, get ecstatic over and over. <laughs> All right, Krishna. Thank you for sharing that. Sri Sarvat Prabhu. Prabhuji, as you were speaking, I was uh, thinking to myself, some time ago, when I was really young, now I'm not as young, uh, those days when I would go to church with my father, I sometimes would think that the the Reverend Minister was talking to me or talking about me because of the sermon the preacher gives. And so in devotional service sometimes, when a devotee speaks, one may think that the devotee is speaking about him instead of the devotee understanding that this is what Krishna Guru is saying and the speaker is inspired to speak and uh, it's not aimed at any particular individual. But if, if we fit into the description of the Katha, then the simplest thing is we try to adjust and do the right thing. So uh, I just want to encourage and remind devotees that whenever we hear the uh, we hear about uh, we hear Krishna Katha it is not aimed at any particular individual it is just a naked truth now Prabhuji, I have a question uh, for you in the sense that we see we see uh, and of course, we are devotees, so most of us may not see, but at least you see it on, on the news, uh, how there is a very strict warning on the packets of cigarettes. Uh, it is clearly written on the packs of cigarettes that uh, cigarette smoking is dangerous. It's hazardous. It can cause cancer. It can cause this. It can cause that. Yet, it's so difficult for people to give up. So the question is, why is it that we know that cigarette smoking is so dangerous and it's so addictive, it's so difficult to give up? Why would we have to manufacture it in the first place? 
And the spiritual aspect to that is uh, Canto, Canto One, if I may put it up here, Canto One, uh, Chapter Five. Let me do this. Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Five. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Canto One. Chapter five. Okay, let's do this. There's a Shema Bhagavatam, Canto one, chapter five. Narada's instructions on Shema Bhagavatam for Vyasa. Uh, Narada has instructed Srila Vyasa Dev, his entrusted disciple, to expand on the uh, teachings of the Supreme Lord. And then uh, Shulabhyasa Dev was having some issues here. And his spiritual master is telling him the reason of his predicament. He says, the people in general are naturally inclined to enjoy. This is Lord uh, uh, Narada Muni speaking, I should say, speaking to Vyasa Dev. The people in general are naturally inclined to enjoy and you have encouraged them in that way, in the name of religion. This is a verily condemned and is quite unreasonable. Because they are guided under your instructions, they will accept such activities in the name of religion and will hardly care for prohibitions. The Supreme Lord is unlimited, only a very expert personality retired from the activities of material happiness, deserves to understand this knowledge of spiritual values. Therefore, those who are not so well situated due to material attachment should be shown the ways of transcendental realization by your goodness through descriptions of the transcendental activities of the Supreme Lord. So my, this is my question. Why would Srila Vyasadev of all people give religion to the world as Narada Muni is saying that it's verily unreasonable and is condemned and is going to make people suffer. And in the purport, Sri Prabhupada talked about the purport of today, uh, 2936, which you highlighted, there are different religions, but none can really help one to uh, attain Krishna consciousness as much as Bhakti Yoga. So the question is, why would Sri Lavyasa Dev create all these different religions in the first place? Um, okay, this is it's a, it's a good question, and I will try to give you a good answer. I'm not sure I'm going to be successful. But uh, Vyasa Dev so. The, first of all, he had to write down things. That's a bad sign. That, that means manda sumanda matayo. People are unfortunate in this age. They have short memory. They have poor intelligence. So the first thing he had to do is to write it down. And then he was thinking, he was considering the lowest common denominator. Uh, he wanted to include everyone. That's why he wrote uh, Mahabharata to trying to include everyone, because everybody likes stories. Everybody likes romance. Everybody likes fighting, you know, except few. And he he actually tried to give some kind of religion uh, mixed in, but it was so diluted. I mean, the Mahabharata is quite an extensive work. It's 100,000 100, verses. And it's so it's so mixed in. It's like if you put... Um, Somehow, if if you make a drink and you put a tablespoon of flavor in a gallon of water, uh, you know, including the sweetener, you're not gonna get much out of that. I mean, it's there. It may be pure. It may be perfect, but the proportion is wrong. So that's what Narada Muni was indicating to Vyasadev that you have to just make it direct. They won't get the message and. Even when you do that, 
most people won't get the message. Just like us. You know, we read and we read the Bhagavatam. And, you know, just we are ecstatic. And we probably miss the main point. And when we read again, same verse. Oh, my God, how did I miss this? How come I, I don't remember reading this at all? How come it's so applicable to my life and I missed it? Because we are distracted. Because we are not very advanced. We we are also part of a manda sumanda matayo. We are kalera, uh, kalera dosha nidheira jan. You know, we we know that this is an ocean of misery, an ocean of fault, and we have to remember the only way out is the Harinam Sankirtan. In this age, it's it's like people who uh, been chanting rounds for a while. And then they stop chanting and they don't feel a difference. Well, it wasn't very good chanting to begin with, apparently. And I my my rounds are terrible, but I know if I'm not chanting, you know, my consciousness changes, my perception changes, my intelligence diminishes. This is not the same thing. So Nara Muni was concerned that. Vyasadeva was making too many concessions, was putting too much water in a, in a drink, and people won't won't get the flavor. So he he didn't tell him toss it out, you know, get rid of the Mahabharata, just just write the Bhagavatam, and whoever whomever gets it gets it, whoever doesn't doesn't. No, it's, there's different instructions for different people. Like uh, Prabhupada quoted the this the sage giving advice to different people. Uh, to the to the brahmachari said die don't live because uh, you're just performing so many austerities so your only your only relief will be when you die that you will actually be elevated and to the butcher say don't live don't die because your life is miserable and when you die it's going to be worse and to the prince said live don't die because you're having a great life but you have to pay for all your sinful activities and your excesses in the name of royal pleasure and to the devotee he said either leave or die because your life is glorious so this is um, different instructions to different people so this is what we can ascertain from uh, Nara Muni's instruction that yeah it's okay Mahabharata is for certain people who will remain at a certain level and won't want to go any further and some may pick up something out of that and demand something higher. And that's what the Bhagavatam yeah, came I $20. Hmm? Sorry. Uh, that's a, an accidental open mic. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't know if I, I did answer your question, but that's my, that's what I can, um, ascertain out of the the conversation between Nara and Vyasa that Vyasa wanted to include everybody and ended up spoiling the nectar by not putting enough sugar and not putting enough flavor and <laughs> Nara Muni being a great cook and uh, Nara Muni actually gave uh, gave a fantastic instruction in Nara Pancharatra there is a verse um aradito yadi haris tapasatata kim naradito yadi haris tapasatata kim antar bahir yadi haris tapasatata kim nantar bahir yadi haris tapasatata kim aradito aradito the, the word rada comes from ara, aradana which means to worship aradito if you're not worshiping yadi haris hari if you're not worshiping hari tapasatata kim what's the use of austerity and if you are worshiping hari and then what's the use of any austerity? And if Antar Bahir, within the heart, Yadi Hari, if you see Hari and you're worshiping Hari within your heart, then what's the point of austerity? And if you're not doing that, what's the point of austerity? So it's, uh, austerity has to have uh, a particular uh, goal, a particular direction. Like I, uh, I was practicing austerities, you know, naturally and uh, when I was young. Naturally, because I I kind of knew that the uh, the goal of life, the the, the un understanding of itself, uh, the the mysteries of the universe, 
won't reveal themselves just to a plain ordinary person who doesn't doesn't do something to gain it. That's why in the Bhagavatam you see that uh, a couple want to have a kid, they practice austerity. They don't just go have sex. They want they want some um, and someone who wants to um, some truth to be revealed, like uh, they need to practice austerities. Drew a Maharaj. He wanted a kingdom and he had to practice austerities. Everybody needs to practice some sort of restraint, some type of austerity, something that is uncomfortable in order to attain spiritual realization. So here is Vyasadev, who's been practicing austerities for, you know, since the moment of his birth from Satyavati, he, he didn't say, uh, you know, where's Guru Kula? He just left for the Himalayas and practiced severe austerities, severe austerities for, for a long time. And that's how he was able to write, to compile the Vedas, to write the Mahabharata, to write the Bhagavatam. So this is the this is the secret, the open secret. And what's our austerity? Just chant Hare Krishna and follow the principles. Really simplified. Couldn't be done any easier. Really. And this is the for the Manda Sumanda people, for the unfortunate. Um, we we have the greatest concession. Because we are all more or less mentally challenged. We are being given a process which even a mentally challenged person can't perform. And it's still difficult. So we should be we should be grateful. We should be grateful to have the association of such advanced devotees as we have. Well, Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Is Madhativya nearby, please? No, she's not. Oh, okay. We just, okay, our, our humble obeisance is to her, if you can pass that on to her for us. Um, I have one other question. If others have question, maybe you ask after this, please. Um, Prabhuji, you were talking about how Sri Prabhupada was not so pleased seeing uh, photos of Sri Krishna standing or sitting by himself alone, that Krishna is never alone. And therefore, uh, we should not think just by pleasing Krishna and not pleasing his devotees, Krishna will be happy. There was one time uh, in one Sangha uh, with you, there was this beautiful description of how Lord Chaitanya, being so compassionate, has a safety net on his transcendental tree that uh, Lord Chaitanya, as we understand from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, is a huge tree, and he himself is also the gardener. And so there are so many uh, devotees in the shape of leaves or twigs and other things. And when one commits offense, there is a safety net that the individual may fall but the net catches the devotee, and so it does not hit the floor to feel so much pains, all because of uh, Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And when I heard that, I was very much impressed by that uh, analogy. But I also think that in that same safety net is a mouse, that this mouse even though it's there, but it's also watching if the devotee is trying to get back to the tree. If the devotee is not trying to get back to the tree and continues his uh, analysis, uh animosity to devotees, then most likely at some point, I believe, this is my speculation and I want to hear your opinion. This is my speculation that at some point, this mouse will chew the safety net up to a point that the individual will have to fall and feel the pains. What do you think about my speculation about the dangers of offending uh, Krishna's devotees? Well, um, that was 
Yeah, it could. It could. Uh, that's the greatest danger to be. Uh, it was described to be in a in a cage with a tiger surrounded by fire. That that would be that would be preferable to be devoid of the association of devotees. Um, but again, the same principle applies that um, Suchinam Srimatam Gehe, that that's not lost. They eventually will come back. That's It may come back as that person that never gets a philosophy in the next life, but they can give, the, give up the association of the Buddhists. And so eventually it will burn all those uh, terrible the terrible result of one's karma, which what what could be more terrible than being devoid of the association of devotees, not understanding Krishna consciousness, not understanding bhakti, the necessity of practicing bhakti um, for one's own sake. For so the misery stop. So yes, the the mouse of uh, offenses. Uh, you probably are alluding to. Uh, one other speaker that you encounter in your in your sangha that seem seem to have you know have a collection of rats you know in the in the net. I I don't know. I am I'm at uh, at a loss here, but I think that offenses are so um, pernicious. They're so pernicious. So I'm always praying to. For to Krishna to uh, please free me from this um, tendency to criticize others. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur speaks about uh, when you feel like criticizing others, just looking faults in yourself. Look about faults in yourself. This is how you should deal with offense when you see, oh, this person is doing this wrong and this person. What about you? What there are so many things that we do wrong that we don't even realize yet. So at least those things that we realize about ourselves that are wrong, well, why don't we concentrate on that instead? Because offenses are yeah, like a ball in a china shop, like the uh, Hati Mata, like the mad elephant offense. Is we will destroy everything. Um, some are bewildered, just simply bewildered. Or, or crazy. So Krishna decides, okay, I'm going to remove this person from the association of saintly devotees so they don't have to deal with this person who is, has some piety, but there is some craziness associated. Or this person is a, is a pathological narcissist. So, you know, he he's seen himself as a center and not Krishna as a center. So he may remove through different processes, people are actually harmful. And you should, we should be grateful that, you know, we don't have to keep so many crazy and narcissistic people around. There are other societies to take care of these people. So we can aspire to have more pure society. But there is still, and, and there is a, huh, I, I have to look this up, but this very interesting Maybe you just give me one moment here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that uh, Rida Ananda Maharaj wrote. I think quite recently that about communities. It was, I should find it in a moment. I think I, I saw it and actually shared it on uh, the Hare Krishna Africa WhatsApp platform. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I think I, I don't know whether I got that from you or from somebody else. And then I, I posted it in the. Uh, yeah. I think that is how I got it. And I shared it, which is very interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. All kinds of people come to the Hare Krishna movement. Yes. Now intelligent, some are crazy, some are fanatic. Yeah, some are yeah, yeah. So we should create a community with those people that are sane and not with the others. That's, you know, you can be, you can have, you can live with, surrounded by some of them, but your community, your friends should be constituted by people who are sane and 
favorable to your advancement. You can yeah. you can be generous to the point that you lose your um, you lose yourself in a, in an ocean of um, crazy people. Yeah, we we our society is is large enough now that we can actually have that kind of luxury. In the in the beginning, in the early days, and I uh, um I joined in nineteen eighty, and uh, those are kind of early days too, and I pretty much knew everybody, and mm. not not an entire movement, but you know, kind of close to wherever I was, wherever country I was, and I met so many people. And, uh, but the movement expanded enormously. So uh, you could, you could tell who were the crazy ones way back when, but nowadays, no, you can't tell. So you have to look for the sane ones. This is, this is a safer policy and try to remain sane yourself. Yeah. And well, wish, wish everybody well, wish everybody well, even those who go astray, even those who, uh, for some reason, they they go to a different society, or those who stop practicing Krishna consciousness, uh, or those who are, you know, from a Guru Kula, they had a very good start, um, and come from family of Vaishnavas, but they are not Vaishnavas, because this is a temporary situation. Eventually, if you offend them, and you will be in their situation. Yeah, you have to see them as they are in transit. They are in, in in a state of gestation, and eventually they will make enough progress to get out of it. And if we offend them, then we may be stuck somewhere along the the same route. And we will see that we are in a traffic jam, and they are passing us, <laughs> zooming by us. Whereas we thought, oh, I'm up here and you're down there. I mean, there's no, there's, it's pretty obvious what's going on. But no, there's, there's just a patch of the road. Then if you if you look at the entire road, then there will be a traffic jam where you're going to get stuck and the other person is going to go by you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting you, you, you referenced... Uh, his Holiness Sri Dananda Swami's, uh, Swami Maharaj's uh, quote, which I, I found it and still find it very interesting. So like I said, I did share. But Sri Prabhupada, in all his books, in his lectures, in his conversations, uh, kept saying uh, some same statements, like keep on chanting, don't give up chanting. So somebody reading Shabbat books may find that this is like too rampant. But if it's frequent, it means that it is an absolute necessity that the devotees do that. Uh, there have been many uh, instances, especially on this particular platform, where criticisms, and offenses have been discussed. And of course, as devotees, everyone trying to be a sincere devotee is very much uh, afraid of uh, offending and unnecessarily criticizing others. But criticism is also a necessity because uh, we are disciples, and a, being a disciple means that we voluntarily accepted to be disciplined. Disciples takes its roots from this discipline. So if one is not ready to be disciplined, then he does not become a disciple. Now, somebody is doing something contrary, blatantly contrary to what? the founder has established. And somebody seeing that says that, if I say something about it to this particular individual, I'm going to be seen as criticizing the individual. So I just said, keep quiet. And if we do that, then where do we go? 
And if somebody is also just interested in always finding faults and always talking about it, that is also detrimental. So what should the devotees do? Should devotees just keep quiet over anything, everything wrong they see or they encounter? Or they should do something about it? And if they should do something about it, how do they approach it? I'm not advocating for the devotees to be quiet and tolerate you know, abuse. Uh, no, they should speak up. Uh, is is only one, but also it depends on your service. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he will address his disciples saying, I'm so unfortunate that I have the service to criticize all of you, to chastise all of you. I'm so unfortunate that I have to do that. But we we take it as sense gratification. That we actually do it out of spite or out of envy or just, just criticize people just to, uh, to think, to feel better about ourselves. So if it is your service, if it's, it's your service, um, definitely you, you have to present. Um, I'm not a very good example because I'm not very... The word very is already is already a bad word, not diplomatic. So I will tell things as I see them without any type of adornment and without being asked and without considering the situation of the audience and how prepared they are to hear and without regards uh, and if it is a relative or temporary truth or an absolute truth. Um, and completely irresponsible as the, the outcome of it, if it's going to destroy a person's heart or relationship or the desire to practice Krishna consciousness. So I'm not a very good example of how to, how to answer this. However, I, I'm an advocate of those who, those who are silent and those who tolerate probably unnecessarily, and they should create boundaries so they can uh, their bhakti creeper can grow healthy not that they should remain silent in all uh, events because oh is this person is you know joined three months before i joined so he's my senior so i can't debate it or this person is uh, my treasurer or my temple president or or my gbc or so on you know should whatever they say is automatically should be automatically consider um, the thing to do and the, and the truth and, and the, the way Krishna wants things. I think everybody has a particular relationship with Krishna and knows or should know what's best for them. And so we should eliminate the criticism, which is simply becomes sense gratification, like gossip, like Prajapa. Uh, you criticize because you know it's a sport to you and you feel good about it and you makes you feel better about yourself and uh if people don't want to hear or not prepared to hear then we should limit our criticism even if it's necessary because the person is not in, in not in any condition to hear it. uh but we should be quite alert and and try to help others sometimes by criticizing sometimes by offering praise where praise is not, um, what do you say, the standard. Mm -hmm. Like, I, 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 I cannot do things like that. I'm, a, I have the year of a musician, so if somebody comes and plays cartels off beat, I just stop them. I tell them, please, you know, find another profession, do, do something else, you know, learn how to make cookies. Just, you know, I'm, Bring some cardboard cartels. I don't want to hear your your clanging. So, uh, but other people will be more tolerant. And Lord Chaitanya asks us to be tolerant and, and humble. So, what what kind of what is tolerance? To tolerate what you can, and uh, whatever is above that level. No, I don't I need to tolerate this. No, we have to sometimes. We have to see, you know, how far we can we can push it. We have to try to 
I mean, it's, a, it's quite a quite a lofty ideal to be more tolerant than a tree, but that's a goal to to be able to tolerate things that are uh, usually easily could be easily dismissed by not tolerating it, by criticizing, by saying no, stop this. Uh, so by tolerating is how you can chant the holy name properly. So sometimes. Uh, we need to criticize. Sometimes we don't. So we have to have enough sense control to know when to stop and enough determination and uh, attachment to the truth to know that even though um, it may not make a difference in my life, I have to tell the truth right now. This person needs to hear it, even if that person is not going to change. But needs that person needs to understand that I can see through what this person is doing and needs to be stopped. And eventually, if said by different people, like they say, if somebody tells you you're drunk, you may ignore him. But if five people in the road tells you you're drunk, you better go find a bed and take a nap because it's probably true. So this is we are we may be. Uh, harming a person by not telling the truth um, and we may be harming a person by telling the truth too early that they're not ready to hear yeah. so it's, it's a question of discrimination you know it's a question of intelligence and it's a question of experience yeah. it's a question of habit i mean it's, it's so many factors involved well, thank you so much uh property uh very satisfying uh response from you because uh, personally, I, I I find it to be a disservice to an individual and to myself and to my guru because if Guru and Krishna led me to see a bad situation, I believe that there is a reason why they let me see it that I should do something. I, I only pray, though, that if I have to say something or if I have to do something in such uh, regard, I do it with utmost respect and also coming out of love. But staying quiet and uh, saying that or thinking that it is not my service, uh, I don't know, maybe in the near future, I may be acting like that. But at the moment, I do not know who actually made that a service for me. But I think it's my service as long as I'm a devotee. And in, in a movement like ESCON, if I find some wrong thing somewhere, and if it is okay for me, to say something about it, I do, and I will. Uh, my only hope and prayer is that I do it with utmost regard, respect uh, to that particular individual. Of course, I am just one person and I do not expect everybody to be like me, but at the moment, this is where I am at. And I think I'm very happy with your answer because it does not make me just blatantly going around criticizing, but I, I'm trying to do that as a service, trying to make sure that things are done the right way as Sri Prabhupada intended. So uh, devotees, if anyone has something to say, please you may do that before we bring this to a close. Jai, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Again, <laughs> thank you so very much for your response in the um, practice of, um, that's just pure bhakti to me, um, approaching devotees in a uh, sincere, you know, way of, uh, you know, just the truthful, being truthful. But mm -hmm. I was listening to a devotee um, the other day in a lecture, and he mentioned something to me that just really stuck with me again. He said that 
I'm not sure if he said Srila Prabhupada said this, but we are in a, the material world is like a hospital. And we all have a disease. Mm -hmm. And I could definitely relate to that, you know. And we're all, you know, we're trying to um, address the disease. And uh, what a wonderful boom to have bhakti as a way to do that. So I just wanted to share that. And again, thank you so very much for uh, for all of your wisdom and uh, realizations. It's been very wonderful. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mother Shapanishad. Uh, Sri Sarvatma, please, uh, if you have some sort of concluding words. Um, just keep chanting. And all the birds of prey of material desires and karma, jnana, etc., will eventually fly away. Just don't, do not ever give up. And uh, also, don't ever think you're cured. Yes, we are in a hospital, but uh, don't ever think you're cured, completely cured until you Hi. seek it personally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Krishna. So Sri Prabhupada said that for a disease person, you need two things. You need good diet and good medication. So we need Prashadam and uh, Hare Krishna Mahamantra. That's our diet and medication respectively. So let's try and then engage in those two. Uh, I had said that I would like to set up bit about our revered speaker, His Grace Sarvatma Prabhu. Uh, don't be. I don't, I don't. I don't have to stay for this, do I? No, you do. Please, <laughs> please do what is. Do not, do not be jealous of me. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm here in Gita Nagri with His Grace uh, Sarvatma Prabhu, who is a very sweet devotee, uh, with his wife, uh, Mother Divya. Um, very, very sweet devotees. Uh, some, some, some people are not so beautiful, but when they take photos, they appear very beautiful. <laughs> and some people are very beautiful, they take photos, they don't appear very beautiful. Um, please, okay, yes. I don't know why my hand was raised. Okay, sorry. So, uh, if you feel that our revered speaker is so sweet, wait till you get in direct contact, personal uh, contact with him. It's much sweeter than you seeing him or hearing him on the screen today. And uh, he is a revered disciple of uh, His Holiness, Ridananda Das Goswami Maharaj, who sometimes confuses me because he signs his name HDG. And oftentimes when I see that, I, I say, his divine grace. <laughs> I don't know if Prabhuji, that happens to you sometimes. Uh, but he's a disciple of Rita Nanda Das Goswami Maharaj. Uh, he is a wonderful, wonderful uh, singer, Kirtanian speaker of the Shastras. And uh, even though he has very good speaking voice, but he has much sweeter singing voice, actually, to me, than his speaking voice. And maybe someday we may have to invite him just to give us sweet nectarian bhajan uh, in this sangha. So if anyone happens to be around Gita Nagri, please stop by, and then we'll have a very nice uh, bhajan with his uh, Grace Sarvatma Prabhu and his beautiful wife, Mother Divya, and the assembled devotees of Gita Nagri, if you happen to be around. So with that being said, uh, I would like to humbly, humbly, humbly request all the devotees to kindly unmute, and we all chant the loudest Hare Krishna Mahamantra to express our appreciation. Okay. To can, I, can I ask you something before that happens? Please, um, yes. I didn't know that you were going to play Prabhupada singing Jai Radha Madhava. So I was, I have my mm -hmm. keyboard ready to do it. So maybe I can do three minutes. Sure, or... sure, sure. Yes, oh, please. It's a, it's a farewell. So I, at least you have some, some uh, taste. Something. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Go ahead. So, we'd we'll love, we'll love to hear that. Yes. Um, can you?
uh, I have to change the, I think the, you have to change it to musicians, right? The, um, the uh, audio, I believe. Not necessarily. I think so. Uh, one, give me one second here. Okay. Audio. Okay. Um, original sound from musicians. Yes, got it. Okay. All right. Okay, so that that should take care of. And also, I wanted to give you a, a darshan of our deities, Radha Govinda. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. So I won't uh, put the camera on myself. I'll just put it on the DDs. Okay. Okay. Just... Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Sahadev. For Hare inviting. Krishna. Thank inviting. you so much. You're welcome. Thank I'm, you so much. I'll see you soon, I hope. Thank yes. yes. So, uh, the word is, uh, we thank you for still hanging around, and we'll go back to our request to kindly uh, please unmute, and we all chant the loudest Hare Krishna Mahamantra to express our appreciation to our revered speaker, His Grace, Sarvatma Prabhu. Jai. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 all glories to his grace, Sarvatma Prabhu Ki Jai. All glories to Samuel Krishna Vashna Jai. Ki Jai. All glories to Samuel Krishna Vashna Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarvatma Prabhu. Hare Krishna.